want you boys to see what you're fighting for, that's all. Hollywood goes to war. A world of tinsel and romance invades the world of olive drab and steel. This is the human interest. These are the candid and compelling moments when we go over there with Hollywood and the stars. U.S. troops fight a grim holding action in a remote corner of the globe, 5,000 miles from home. Their days are measured by the relentless pendulum of war, swinging from bloodshed to boredom and back again. But there are memorable moments of respite, moments when vivid personalities lift, if only for a time, the burden of battle. Stars like Al Jolson, Debbie Reynolds, Mickey Rooney, and Marilyn Monroe. This is a traditional scene, a traditional thing for a star to do. For it was established long ago that when the nation went to war, Hollywood went too. World War I. As the Doughboys march off to foreign battlefields, the government must rally Americans on the home front. To help spark Liberty Bond drives, it enlists a new kind of popular idol, movie stars like Feshu Hayakawa, Sarah Bernhard, Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and most popular of all, Mary Pickford. Little Mary sells five million dollars worth of bonds in a single afternoon. From this moment on, Hollywood stars will be recognized as unparalleled fundraisers and morale builders in time of war. After the war, however, Hollywood turns another face to the world. In the 20s and 30s, it becomes a lotus land whose godlike inhabitants seem sublimely above common concern. And this is one of its greatest charms. When headlines shriek of economic crisis, later of another impending war, it's reassuring to hear that Hollywood's big news is who was seen with whom last night at Ciro. By 1940, as war engulfs Europe, it's somewhat disquieting when Hollywood illusion is touched by harsh reality. When, for instance, the suave Robert Montgomery volunteers as an ambulance driver in embattled France. Well, uh, I've been told that you are going to the front tonight. Yes, we're moving up tonight. Yes, and uh, you are uh, driving uh, an ambulance? No, I'm being driven up by one of the drivers who's already been up there. Yes, I see. And uh, you, you think you, you're going to stay long in France? I'll be here quite some time, Quite some time. But within a few months, the Battle of France is over. The Nazis are in Paris, and London is in flames. In increasing numbers, Hollywood stars respond to the distant drums of war. Bundles for Britain is the rallying cry of sewing circles. 
promoted by stars such as Merle Oberon, Dorothy L'Amour, Fred McMurray and Madeline Carroll. Months before Pearl Harbor, leading man Jimmy Stewart turns up at an army induction center. The public is amazed that a $1,500 a week star would volunteer to become a buck private in peacetime. And the dashing swashbuckler, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., dons the uniform of a naval officer. He will win numerous decorations for exceptional bravery and valor in World War II. The bombing of Pearl Harbor spawns wild rumors of a possible Japanese invasion of the West Coast. The lush Malibu beach colony bristles with hidden fortifications as movie land mobilizes. With the nation at war, barrage balloons even float over Sunset Boulevard. Stars like Cesar Romero and Buster Keaton join volunteer evacuation corps preparing to rush civilians inland when the enemy strikes. Other celebrities hit the road on bond tours. Within days after Pearl Harbor, these glamorous Paul Revere's are helping to call the nation to arms. This is America, where even the serious business of buying bonds flourishes best with a dash of Hollywood salesmanship. Neighborhood movie theater pushes the war effort along with the latest double features. At the box office, you're urged to buy a $25 bond along with your 25 cent ticket. And on the screen, the so-called impromptu appeal becomes a familiar tactic to movie audiences in the war years. Stars like Loretta Young are caught unaware on movie sets. As soon as she finishes the scene, she has something she wants to say to you. Cut! All right, Mr. Pell? Yes. Thank you. Miss Young? Yes? May we have a moment of your time? Yes, you certainly may. Because that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask each one of you here to give me a moment of her time. Women at War Week reminds us that we need no longer sit and wait. There is a job for each and every one of us, and it is our duty to find that job. Because every job we do is a pledge that our homes will not be destroyed. And every bond we buy is a promise that our children will not grow up in bondage. Oh, Miss Clamp. Yes, Jane? Could I please say something before we leave? Jane Withers mobilizes the high school set. You know, we movie kids don't get a chance to go to a regular school like other boys and girls, but, well, there's one thing we can do, the same as everyone else in the United States. We can help our country by buying defense savings bonds. <laughs> I suppose that some of you are buying these bonds already. But with the new system of letting us buy stamps for only 10 cents each, well, everyone can afford to start buying them right now. What do you say, gang? In the newsreel, Walt Disney does his bit for the scrap drive by sacrificing a metal statue of Bambi. Veronica Lake gives her all by changing her celebrated peekaboo hairstyle. In war plants across the country, women with Veronica's hairdo are an industrial hazard. And so, Veronica sets a patriotic example. She even auctions off a stray curl for $186,000 worth of war bonds. But even on the home front, war is a grim affair. A tragic fate awaits Carol Lombard, the most brilliant comedian of the decade and wife of superstar Clark Gable. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, she throws herself into war work. And leaving you now, I want you all to join me in raising your hands and making the sign of victory. The V sign popularized by our famous ally across the sea, Winston Churchill. Heads and hands up, America. Let's give a rousing cheer that will be heard in Berlin and Tokyo. <laughs> Only hours later, Carl Lombard's bond tour ends in a fatal plane crash. One of the screen's most vibrant and glamorous women is Hollywood's first casualty in World War II. 
Soon after his wife's death, a grimly determined Clark Gable joins the Army Air Corps. He wins his wings, becomes one of the first stars to serve in Europe, and mans a gun turret on combat missions over Germany. Familiar figures in unfamiliar roles. Every day, it seems another star rallies to the flag. Marine Sergeant Tyrone Power. Private Glenn Ford. Naval Lieutenant Henry Fonda. Apprentice Seaman Gene Kelly. Sergeant Gene Autry. And Lieutenant Wayne Morris of the Naval Air Corps, who becomes a full-fledged combat ace in the South Pacific. More than 40,000 movie workers from stars to stagehands enter the armed forces and leave Hollywood. But throughout the war, off-duty servicemen are welcomed to the movie capital and given a taste of its celebrated excitement and glamour. There's a standing open house for men in uniform at many of Hollywood's most lavish homes. And there's even a kind of G.I.'s Disneyland called the Hollywood Canteen. Patronized by the servicemen, it is run by the star. Here, the hat check girl not only looks like, but is Hedy Lamar. And if you're lucky, you may even be able to tell your buddies how you went over big with a volunteer hostess like Marlena Dietrich. Most of all, the canteen provides free a roster of talent that top nightclubs might envy. Stars like Dick Powell are in the spotlight every night of the week. Over the sea, let's go. Hollywood turns out films that make combat seem like a shoot 'em up western. These movies are great morale boosters, but some of Hollywood's top directors now give audiences a different view of war. Documentary films like William Wyler's Memphis Bell capture the actual sight and sound of a Nazi interceptor attack on U.S. bombers. Fighters at six o'clock. This is what a gunner sees speck in the sky. That's a fighter. And then a blink. That means he's firing at you. 2,300 rounds a minute. John Houston's Battle of San Pietro shows the unsung heroism of the anonymous GI. Throughout the war, scores of combat cameramen pay with their lives to record scenes like these. An entire nation feels beholden to these men, and Hollywood can express its gratitude in very special ways. 
celebrities begin to range the globe, playing the foxhole circuit. Organized by the USO, it is the biggest vaudeville chain in history. A procession of stars, an extraordinary variety of warm and spontaneous entertainment. Before the war, Joey Brown was a stay-at-home Hollywood family man. But in 1942, his eldest son, Don, is killed in a bomber crash. And now, Joey Brown devotes himself to meeting and entertaining G.I.s. When you've lost your own boy, he says, all other lads become your sons. For energy and sheer endurance, Bob Hope is respected even by combat-hardened troops. And with his uncanny instinct for the broad and bawdy humor of the serviceman, he wins a nickname he invented. To the G.I.s, he is Trader Corn. I broke when I first started, you thought it was going to be lousy, huh? Ah! Nothing to it. My hand just burned off. <laughs> Who's that, Jerry and the number three? <laughs> Are we winning? Huh? I'm uh, very happy to be here. I understand Crosby was here last year. Is that right? That's right. Well, I'm here to apologize for him. Here you are. <laughs> Uncle Sam is true, a minute's are too few. I wish that I could kiss each and every one of you. So... You want to get us trampled to death, the youth kid? Thanks for the memory. You boys at this here bay, you boys who set the pace. Cause you're the guys who are gonna go into Fuhrer's face. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Overseas entertainment becomes a massive enterprise as the war wears on. For dozens of enthusiastic stars, a tour of the war front becomes almost as routine as a trip to Schwab's drugstore. Edward G. Robinson visits the front lines in Italy. Danny Kaye delights G.I.s with his irrepressible nonsense. In the Pacific Theater, Gary Cooper visits Atoll's newly won from the Japanese. John Wayne turns up at lonely outposts in the Australian bush country. And violin virtuoso Jack Benny travels thousands of miles in an effort to widen the boys' cultural horizons. In liberated Paris, Marlena Dietrich opens a serviceman's canteen and salutes the troops with a favorite barroom ballad. Oh, see what the boys in the back room will have. Tell them I'm having the same. Go see what the boys in the back room will have and give them the poison they may. And when I die, don't spend my money on flowers in my picture in a frame. Go see what the boys in the back room will have and tell them I die. And tell them I cry. And tell them I die of the same. And along with the stars, the movies themselves hit the front. Improvised theaters spring up, often within shelling range of the enemy. Here the G.I. prefers and gets straight Hollywood escapism. He has a lot to escape from. Hollywood infiltrates the services so well that few G.I.s are beyond its reach. Saturday night, there's the movies. The rest of the time, the Armed Forces Radio Service is on the air. And now comes the Ordnance Gang at 863 with a letter from Sarge Everett Hankey and Corporal Roland Lipton and this little dilly. It says, Dear Command, in close, please find peace off top of Stuka Dive Bomber, for which you will please have Lana Turner come out and fry us a three-inch porterhouse steak smothered with onions, and let's hear it sizzle. 
Just to prove there's no request too large, fellas, here she is, Lana Turner. <laughs> Lana, let's get on with this thing. Be a good girl and let's fry that steak, huh? Okay. Bring on the porterhouse steak! <laughs> well, look, they got an armed guard around the steak. <laughs> Oh, look at this. Well, all right, Bob. Is your griddle hot? Yeah, my, I think so. Oh, my... Oh, my... Oh, my. <laughs> that, that'll do, Bob. Now, the steak, please. Oh, uh, well, here it is, fellas. Beautiful. A porterhouse steak, three inches thick. The only one in captivity. Are you gonna give that a hot foot? Into the frying pan. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, yes. There you are, fellas. That's the sound of a steak sizzling. Fellas, that's the steak. That's not me sizzling. That's the steak. And fellas, I wish I could cook a big steak for each and every one of you. Oh, boy, what a turnout. Isn't this wonderful, Groucho? Wonderful? What's wonderful about it? Where are all the girls? Uh, girls? Did you expect to see girls at a Marine camp? Of course. Where's Marine O'Sullivan and Marine O'Hara and Marine Dietrich? <laughs> Ah, Semper Fidelis. I love those Marines. Music has unusual powers to lift the G.I.'s morale. And a song from a performer like Judy Garland takes on a very special meaning for a war-weary world. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles melt like lemon drops away above the chimney tops. That's where you find me Somewhere over the rainbow For the men and women who endured four harrowing and uncertain years, it is finally over. They have done their job. And in its own way, Hollywood has too. For millions of G.I.s, Hollywood found songs enough to ease loneliness and dreams enough to sustain men until this day when no dream is needed. Beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't... Next on Hollywood and the Stars, an adventure into the backstage world of movie making. The exciting journey of a movie company on location all over the world. A journey led by one of America's most controversial producer-directors, Otto Preminger, during the filming of his latest production, The Cardinal. The Anatomy of a Movie, next on Hollywood and the Stars.